Paula Park, how are you today? Hi, so good to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I'm excited. Uh, our mutual friend, our PR friend introduced us and uh, you have such an interesting background. So you're Korean Brazilian, which yeah. is which is cool. That's that's actually a great mix of cultures, I think, in many ways. And then um, you have a really interesting background, done a lot of social um, media impact campaigns, philanthropy campaigns, work with Scooter Bronze Agency. Mm -hmm. um worked with Demi Lovato several mm -hmm. other artists that we are all are all very familiar with and your newest project is Audrey Nuna who was just featured in Rolling Stone which is very exciting yeah so tell me tell me about you how did you get started in this business and maybe a little bit about your background yeah no of course thank you for that question first of all um I the way I got started in music was very young at an early age, just like most people, just as a lover of music. Ever since I was a kid, um, I played the piano, took some, you know, acoustic guitar lessons, did voice lessons, all of that. But I went to economic school and then went to live in Korea for a little bit, met a lot of really creative people there um, and just kind of like came back from Korea decided to change my whole life um, and went to Berklee College of Music. So I think like I really started in this industry in the academic path of like being a, muse a student of music, um, which I think shapes you to be a very specific kind of professional in the industry. Um, but yeah, so I graduated from Berkeley in music production and engineering and then music, music business as well. And my first job was at Universal Music Brazil. Um, so kind of as a shock to myself, actually, because I, I didn't know, you know, leaving a very pro artist school, you never think that you're going to go to a major, but, um, but yeah, it was a great experience to work in Brazil, very short, decided to come back to the U S and, uh, started as an intern at SB projects. Awesome. Yeah. And, and Brazil, I mean, that has, they have such a vibrant music culture there obviously yeah. um a lot of great i mean food everything <laughs> so it's so exciting and your parents yeah. so your parents were actually um living you grew up in brazil originally right yes born and raised awesome so you speak portuguese as well i guess yes awesome. that's my native language yeah great um so when you so you studied music production and all that at berkeley which is a great school for that of course one of the one of the legendary schools um and then so you kind of got into social media and that kind of thing which is obviously for artists is so important and philanthropy which is which is interesting so tell me about that working with scooter braun getting into that that situation yeah, so as an intern at Scooter, I started working under Alex Burdoff, who used to be the VP of marketing at SB. Um, he uh, just tragically passed away at 30 years old due to a rare cancer, but he was a big mentor of mine and um, very tapped in and like data and marketing and all of that and just like made me very passionate about just understanding more of what it took to kind of build these campaigns around artists. Um, I actually had a hiatus between my internship and actually working at SB. And I went to doing other things. And once I came back, I worked under Tony Bracey and Shauna Knapp. So Tony was, is the head of marketing at SB and Shauna was the head of um, philanthropy at the time. Uh, she's no longer in-house at SB, but still like a force to be reckoned with in this industry when it comes to the intersection of impact and entertainment. So learned definitely from the best, as so I should say that first. But um, my heart, because I did economics before, and the reason why I did it was because I really thought that, you know, I always had this sense of just kind of social responsibility and wanted to make my country better and just thought that the path to doing that was working in the government or like working as a diplomat or something like that. And, um, you know, as I grew up and just kind of, I wouldn't say lost faith, but, you know, definitely had the awakening of the challenges of work, having, you know, holding public office and all of these things and just how, how it is difficult to drive change in that setting. I, I turned to music as I believe it's like the most powerful tool to drive change um, because it's it's you know you can I think it's one of the few like universal languages that can actually like emotionally connect with people and I 
saw throughout history how like music preceded a lot of like political change and societal change and so I just kind of felt like you know I was very just genuinely very passionate about music and really believed in it in this very like romanticized you know narrative around it and how it could shape society and shape culture so being able to work with Sean I think was like a very monumental piece of my life because she really embodied that like the intersection of you know doing philanthropy and how to use artist platforms to drive change and a big core of like the whole work she taught me to do and also that I did at SB after she departed as in-house um, is really was really to figure out what we wanted you know what our clients wanted their legacy to be beyond music and trying to actually execute that and so I think um, I, I hope I answered your question somewhere. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because it's a big question and I get that because yeah. you kind of when you're young, you, you start off on a um, a certain path and you're you have a certain vision of, or, of the world. And as you get out there and you start interacting with other, other professionals, mm -hmm. your views change as they as they should. You're learning. Right. Sure. Um, so tell me about so now you have your own company. What What is the name of your of your own company or your brand? Yeah, it's called Soft Serve. It's recently launched, but it's, yeah, it's called Soft Serve. Uh, I love the name. <laughs> Thank you. Everybody, that makes everybody happy. Soft Serve, I like that. Yes, um, yes, exactly. So working with um, artists, uh, like the one that you're working with now, Audrey Nuna, and new artists, young artists, you felt, I guess these days, most artists understand the impact of social media, or what's your, been your experience with that? No, for sure. I think it's an undeniable you know, reality for everybody. I mean, like it or not, I think it's it's how people shape their sense of reality at this point. You know, it's um, from political from political opinions to just you know funny content. It's like how most people spend most of their days. Um, so it's just it's just an unavoidable fact that you have to be fluent. I think it's. I think it's a a mistake to think that there's one right way of doing it. Certainly there are like best practices, but I feel like the artists that continue to be able to um, navigate social media fluently are those who are more adaptable and um, are just more authentic to how they use each platform, what they're sharing, instead of just trying to like, mimic every single best practice that they hear you know and just like seeing it as a another channel for them to connect with their fans so right and it can be daunting I mean because there's there's so many for different sure. pathways you have to kind of choose your narrative right 100 percent. I think I think look I I think social media is a very powerful tool um I think it has certainly the industry, at least I'm one of the believers that do think that there should be more balance. I think the, you know, artists and their team should draw some boundaries, you know, with, with how much they spend of their creative capacity, just focused on social media. And right. I do think artists need to be artists first before they are social media influencers, you know? And I think the time should be carved out with that priority in mind. Yeah, and I mean, it's good to have, you have your brand, but you also want to be authentic and not yeah. just not just posting for the sake of posting necessarily. Exactly. I mean, sometimes it's okay, but it depends. Like you said, the, if you're trying to build an audience and what your goal is, maybe. For sure. um, so when you work with a new artist, like what's your kind of bullet points to go over with them and, and kind of your, how do, how do you deal with that? Yeah, I think for me, the most important thing is vision um, in just feeling I need to know that the artist has like a strong sense of self, right? Like, I think that's something that you can't teach an artist. They either know who they are. They either know what they want to say. They know who they want to be in the industry or they're still figuring it out, which is totally fine. But that's something that no one can actually teach them how to have that certainty and how to feel belonging into themselves and you know the courage that it takes to live that out 
So I think it's really trying to unveil that and really learn. And I think, you know, in my philanthropy experience that Scooter really taught me to have that more like eyes on the long term, eyes on longevity, on vision and and building a strategy backwards from that instead of just being so reactive to the moment. Yeah. And when you work with, you know, like Demi Lovato, these kind of major major artists um yeah. how, how do you kind of work with them shape shape them they've already got a career going have you found that they're willing to listen to you or do you get pushback what's the normal thing for you with that it is so interesting well I had a very specific seat at SB which I think um you know it it allows for more of that conversation of what they're passionate about beyond music because you know like people who are typically working in departments that are very tied to music they're just thinking about the next project and yeah next tunnel and tunnel next. vision right. yeah it's like you know which is which is important and it's it's you know um and i i can't speak much um of that piece of it but when it comes to philanthropy and social impact and activating platforms and building this vision and like their legacy beyond everything else, beyond the next single, beyond the next project, beyond the next album rollout, it really opens up the artist to actually be honest with what drives their passion, like what's behind all of this, like what, like what really what do they really care about? You yeah, know? what grabs and, their soul kind of yeah. exactly. And I think that is um you just get a different sort of relationship and I think engagement from clients when you're approaching them in that way, you know, because you're seeing the artist, the entertainer, but you're also seeing the human behind it. And I think it's um, it's not so much uh, them listening to me as much as me learning who they really are and what they really want to see through. Uh, and I always used to say that I was so biased um, about all of these clients because the you know the privilege that I got was to see them in their best light right it was like to actually have conversations about like what they really wanted to do and what their focus is in terms of like issues and societal um influence so yeah I mean I they they have all been really amazing and I think it's just a privilege of a lifetime to have been working in those accounts for a couple right of and I think, um, so, you know, philanthropy can mean a lot of different things. And what was your focus with that? Like trying to find out what was really near and dear to their hearts in terms of like, maybe it's voting, maybe it's children's causes. Exactly. How do you suss that out and, and kind of, kind of go in that, into that world? Yeah, it's, it's, that's a great question. Um, you know, typically I started working with the bigger accounts when they were already massive and established. Right. And when it, like when, when you are an artist of that stature, you most likely kind of already know what you're passionate about and what you want to kind of put your, give your two cents in. And, you know, you've, you faced a lot of backlash already. You've done all the things, you know? So uh, you know that as a public person, the asks are gonna be infinite and forever. And so right. you can't also set the precedent of, you know, raising your hand every time something goes wrong, because otherwise you're just going to have to do that, you know? Yeah, because you have, you have your actual career going and it, then you also, so you have to kind of find the balance, right? Yeah. And it's also like, it's very tough for you to drive change if you're like spread too thin, right? So like, it is more impactful for you to be strategic about like how, like, what are you messaging and where you're, what are you focusing on, who you're partnering with? So it is, that is a big piece of the work, but I think to your point, I think it's just, um those artists I mean a hundred percent of my time at least they are like working in bigger accounts they already knew and had kind of like the issue areas that they were very focused on and had built credibility and their legacy on already and so it was kind of like just trying to hone in more of like at which stage they were in their careers what they were going to do music wise and, and with different projects and what were we looking to do? So um, we we think a lot about, we have different kind of like matrices or like uh, criterias when we're thinking about impact, right? You're thinking about is this and like, do we want to focus um, this time in like a local, in, in 
you know, engaging in more local initiatives or national, federal initiatives or international, right? Yep. Like, are you, do you, are you like in a, an album cycle and maybe you have like lower capacity for like actually being on the grounds doing things? Like, are you trying to approach this more like in an educational, you know, having an educational approach or like, do you actually want to like give in time or give in money? Like, do you, is it right. uh, about like, engaging your fans or is it more about you giving back like so there are like various different ways of approaching any sort of like societal issue um so with Demi you know at least like the period of time that I worked with her um was very much focused around like mental health and um that was like a big big priority during at least like the year that I led that account more and reproductive rights, because it was, it had been right after, you know, the overturn of Roe v. Wade. Right. So it was very focused on two, those two specific issues, at least the time that I was in the account. And then um, for Quavo, for instance, you know, I was there since prior to takeoff's passing. So I had seen his philanthropy, which was very focused about around giving back to the communities in Atlanta. So whether that was like investing in youth programs, um, you know, doing community events and uh, starting a guaranteed income program for black single moms. So he had been very active in Atlanta before takeoff's passing and after his passing, he kind of added to that the more the through line of actually making community safer and building a foundation with programming around gun violence prevention and community violence intervention. So it's also like that th this just goes to sh show, you know, like with Demi, there are a lot of campaigns and initiatives she would be a part of, talks, um, conferences. With Quavo, he actually built a foundation, right? So it's like, and each artist will have their own way of um, how they want to go about it, the time commitment, the uh, capital commitment, um, how, how much of that is integrated to music, how much of that is, is, uh, more detached from their music careers, you know, like, so there, there's so many different, yeah, it's, it's a huge, it's a huge, um, thing. And, and like, you know, philanthropy, because a lot of people hear that term and they don't really understand what that means. And then, like yeah, you say, right. for artists, they're artists, they have a cycle, they have an album cycle touring, and then trying to make that all work is a big job for you. Right. <laughs> for sure. And I, I think, I think it is, you know, if you really understand where the artist is at and what they really want, and they can properly communicate that to their managers, because that's the thing, like, I think at the, at the end of the day, you have a liaison that's a manager too, that sees the career of the artist more like 360, right? So they know whether that should be taking precedent over other things or not um if that's the time or not and um so certainly it's it's a it's a lot to navigate and fit in but i think as as much aligned as you can be with all those stakeholders and the more you can show that this is not actually a trade off to all these other things but it's actually you know part of the dna of everything and like building credibility to the longevity of an artist's career i think everybody gets aligned and it's you know yeah, every, everybody wins in that situation. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah and you want to, I mean, you have that kind of a platform. You want to do good things. I think most most artists do. Um, 100%. Yeah. What, what's your advice, speaking of artists, what's your advice for new artists in terms of navigating social and, and being involved in, in uh, philanthropy and those kind of things? What What's some of the big kind of points that you would go over with somebody who, who you just, you know, just got involved with? Yeah. Yeah. Um... I think my advice, honestly, is, and I, I feel that this is going to be a little like an, a cringy answer um, <laughs> and a little bit tacky, but I'll say it anyways, because it's really what I believe. Um, I think my advice is around authenticity and just really having the courage and the, the, the boldness of exploring that and, and standing for that, because right now with streaming and social media and all of that i think the biggest challenge is like how do you break from the noise right it's an oversaturated industry there's so many people everybody has a phone everybody can become an influencer you know like you don't you have all these tools right now that you don't really need to have the 
like be so talented you know you can melodyne your voice and just you know use AI to create your songs and like there are all these things that um can can make you an entertainer right but I think what really sets an entertainer and an artist apart and certainly you can be both which is like you know the the I think um when you see those household names they certainly know how to how to be both but when you are you can also certainly be one or the other, you know, and I think an entertainer who's not an artist is is definitely I would I would at least risk to say that it's most of what you see right now. And um, I think for artists that really do want to carve their space and, you know, history and just have their mark and culture and really move the needle in some way it's really important for them to be authentic. And I think that's going to win every time, you know, it's not, it's so beyond just a song and just, in just one project is really what they have to say. And I think if they can fully embody that, they have a bigger chance of cutting through the noise and just actually, actually connecting with people. Yeah. I think that's a very insightful answer. And I, and I've, I've dealt with that in my, in kind of my music background as well, like authenticity rules that that wins the day. Yeah. yeah, and it's hard. It's definitely not easy, you know. I think it's it's tough for you to be a creative um, in this day and age. I do think I, I you know, in, the processes are easier, but I think for you to actually make a living, a proper living, and and live from music and do it's tough. It's so much competition. It's you know, for you to remain culturally relevant, like there's so so many hats that you need to wear that like has nothing to do with music, has nothing to do with your craft. And it it to me it pains me, you know, again as like a student of music. I know there was one time I I met BB King at his show, like when I was a fan and he was still alive. And his one advice to me as a student was like, just practice, you know, practice, 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 practice. Cause that, that's the, the world he came from and grew up in and like built his legacy on. Right. And, and now like people do need to practice so much, but they also need to do all these other things. And, um, and I think for, for you to, like I said before, just like when in this oversaturated market, it's, you need to be, you need to find what makes you unique instead yeah. of you know just trying to replicate what you see working for other people yeah and it's important to be a fully fleshed out human not just not just a musician not just like you said a performer because yeah. everybody's everybody is many things and like you say when you have a passion for something i think many artists they spend so much time trying to get there and to make it that a lot of that other stuff kind of gets pushed down but then when once you get a, a huge platform that's the opportunity to really bring that forward Exactly. Yeah. Um, how can people find you online and, and contact you and all that all that stuff? Yeah. So um, the online Instagram is the only real real platform. I let my artists do TikToks and everything else. I only I only use Instagram is at PE Park. And my email, obviously, always happy to connect with other creative folks is Paula at soft serve.co. Awesome. And we'll, we'll include that in the uh, podcast listing. Thank you so much for joining me. You have a really great um, background and it's great to, to hear your insights and, and in a very tricky area <laughs> for artists, as we know. No, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I, I enjoy talking to you. Awesome. Have a great day, Paula. Thank you, you too.